One of the most considered thought experiments in human history has to be how the world would have been different if the Axis powers and not the Allies during World War II, if Heisenberg and not Oppenheimer had won the race to the atomic bomb. The question isn't purely academic either. Both sides had their best minds on the issue. The physicists at Los Alamos versus the physicists here in Germany. Of course, everyone knows who won that race, but not everyone knows exactly how. Not only did Oppenheimer and his team beat the Axis powers to nuclear fission, the Allies tried their damnedest to slow down the German nuclear program any way that they could, which included one of the most important acts of sabotage in all of World War II. This is the true story of the secret mission to destroy Germany's heavy water. It was the only offensive use of a nuclear weapon that ended World War II. On August 6, 1945, the United States decided to vaporize some 80,000 people in Hiroshima, Japan, in less time than it took me to read this sentence. The Second Great War may have already been winding down at that time, but Fat Man and Little Boy undoubtedly declared the winners. One of history's greatest questions, however, is what would have happened if those weapons had German names? If the so-called Uranium Club, started in Nazi Germany in 1939, had beaten Oppenheimer to the bomb. This historical counterfactual wasn't an impossible timeline. By the end of 1939, renowned physicist Werner Heisenberg knew that the weaponization of nuclear reactions was possible. He believed all Germany needed was enough of a single, incredibly rare substance critical to advancing nuclear physics. Heavy water. Adolf Hitler would be dead, and the fighting in Germany would end before the United States conducted the first atomic test in the early morning hours of July 16, 1945. A rehearsal for codename Trinity actually happened on the very day Germany surrendered. Still, had German scientists been just a few months ahead of their American counterparts, the future of the war, and indeed, the future of the world, could have looked very different. That future was prevented not only by Los Alamos scientists' specific design decisions, as we'll learn, but by a daring adventure, by a handful of young Norwegian commandos skiing over frozen tundra. The Wehrmacht's determination to have the nuclear age start in Germany was the driving force behind two incredible efforts. One you've certainly heard of, one you probably have not. The first was the Manhattan Project, which was ultimately successful and world-changing. The second, successful in a different way, was Operation Gunnerside, the secret plan to destroy any capabilities the Axis powers had to create precious heavy water in the snowy landscapes of Norway. A plan called one of the most important acts of sabotage in human history. March 1942. Japanese forces had just decimated Pearl Harbor a few months before and officially dragged Britain and the United States into the meat grinders of modern combat. At the same time, on the other side of the world, a lone Norwegian soldier was parachuting into his German-occupied homeland for reconnaissance. Norway had the only source of heavy water in the world, the Vimork hydroelectric power plant, and the Allies needed to know how fast the German atomic bomb program was progressing with this substance. He patiently gathered information at Vermork for months until four more Norwegians were dropped just west of his location. Codenamed Grouse, these young men were told to group up, prepare to sabotage the plant, and wait for reinforcements. On November 19th, those reinforcements came in the form of 34 specially trained British engineers and pilots. The plan was for the British sabotage group to land on a frozen lake nearby via airplane-towed gliders, rendezvous with the Norwegians embedded in the woods, and then destroy Vermork's heavy water production facility with explosives. But they never reached the ground. One plane and its glider crashed into a mountainside, killing everyone on board. The other glider crash-landed after its tow plane attempted to abort mission, killing most of that team. 
German soldiers would quickly find, torture, and shoot the rest. The Norwegians alive on the ground in their Nazi-occupied homeland were now in a terrible situation, forced to lay low and brave a harsh winter until another mission could be planned and executed. The small group changed their name from Grouse to Swallow and hid for weeks amongst the trees and caves of a mountain plateau. It was a bare existence. They subsisted on moss, lichen, and a single reindeer captured just before Christmas, 1943. Holiday dinner was gamey meat and the contents of the deer's stomach. Nuclear physics abounds with complicated terminology, but thankfully, heavy water is relatively simple to understand. All it is, is water that has extra neutrons in it, extra particles, hence extra mass. Technically, it's hydrogen with one extra neutron in its nucleus, deuterium, or with two extra neutrons in its nucleus, tritium. Chemically, inside of the body, Heavy water acts chemically the same and wouldn't do anything to you. And if you had a water bottle of it, you wouldn't be able to tell any mass difference. However, you can do an experiment, as you see here. If you make an ice cube purely out of heavy water, it sinks rather than floats. Heavy water inside the body doesn't do anything special, but inside of a nuclear reactor, heavy water does something that light water does not. And that's what the Germans were counting on. Heavy water may not be interesting to your biology, but it's a critical substance in nuclear physics, or it was at the time. Right before they surrendered, Nazi scientists were banking on the stuff to be how they would take over the world. That's because heavy water is heavier, it has extra neutrons, and it would slow down the neutrons that come screaming out of nuclear fission reactions. Once slowed down to thermal speed, these neutrons would be more likely to split other fissile atoms nearby and begin a chain reaction. The ability of a material to do this is called moderation. More moderation means less actual material, in this case uranium or plutonium, needed to achieve a critical mass, the minimum amount of a material needed to initiate a spontaneous chain reaction. This is where the massive release of energy comes from, and therefore a potential weapon's destructive power. German scientists thought heavy water would be the key to their atomic program. Oppenheimer and the scientists at Los Alamos thought something else. Heavy water is not the only moderating material, and natural uranium is not the only form of the element. Instead of using a rare form of water and unenriched uranium, American scientists would pursue the physics enabled by enriched uranium, uranium with a much higher percentage of fissile or splittable atoms, and graphite, a moderating material that was much easier to get their hands on than deuterium and tritium. It would be the respective rarities of their materials and their purities that would ultimately doom the German program almost from the start. Before the war in 1934, the Vomork hydroelectric power plant became the world's first commercial heavy water plant, with a capacity to produce 12 tons of D2O per year. In 1940, Germany invaded Norway and immediately took ownership of 185 kilograms of the moderator, less than 50 gallons of heavy water, but it was the world's entire supply. If Heisenberg and his scientists were right, a nuclear reactor, plutonium, and an atomic bomb would follow shortly thereafter the Allies weren't going to let this happen. And so, before the invasion of Norway, the French secretly moved the world's extant supply of heavy water off-site and then off-country, the first setback for the Uranium Club. However, Vomork still had the ability to produce thousands of kilograms of heavy water per year. This is why, while a handful of young Norwegians shivered in the snow, sustained by a single reindeer, another mission to the plant was planned another sabotage to save the world. Heavy water is rare, but natural. In seawater, for example, there is one deuterium atom for every 6,400 hydrogen atoms. It can be concentrated by various methods, but at Vermork, the Germans were relying on electrolysis, applying direct current to drive chemical reactions. It works because regular water bonds happen to break more easily than heavy water ones. So by running electricity, 
energy through regular water in the presence of a catalyst, what water remains after bonds break and hydrogen gas escapes is pure D2O. But only a very small amount, maybe one milliliter for every 30 liters of regular water. Modern methods are of course far more efficient than this and less energy intensive, but Vermork was a power plant. It had electricity to spare. And so what was once simply a byproduct of fertilizer production was now a mass production operation by the Nazis. A series of cascading electrolysis chambers that would provide the lifeblood of Germany's atomic weapons program. This unassuming series of metal tubes these few pipes in a featureless concrete room was the target of Operation Gunnerside. Before Operation Gunnerside would once again send commandos into a Nazi-controlled power plant, Norwegian Royal Army Colonel Leif Tronstad reportedly informed his soldiers, quote, I cannot tell you why this mission is so important, but if you succeed, it will live on in Norway's memory for a hundred years. And then, the colonel handed the men their suicide capsules. They would need them if they were captured, given what happened to the last would-be saboteurs. On February 16, 1943, this new group of six young Norwegians landed on the same mountain plateau where their compatriots were surviving. They joined the still combat-able Swallow team after several days of harsh weather. Eleven days later, on the 27th, the assemblage was in striking distance of Vermork. The direct approach was now fortified with mines and floodlights and guarded by additional soldiers after the first failed attempt months before. Impossible. So the men took the long way around. The very long way. The morgue had the tactical advantage of clinging to a steep hillside. Any approach from the side, therefore, would mean climbing down and up an icy ravine so treacherous that the Nazis weren't even defending it. It was 200 meters deep. Undaunted, the commandos climbed down the ravine, crossed a frozen stream, and then climbed back up the other side, equivalent to scaling a 50-story building, in the dark, carrying weapons and explosives, twice. Through heroic effort, the men made it to an unsecured section of the plant, silently cut through a fence, and proceeded onwards. The demolition party had come with both explosives and inside information about the layout of the plant. The Norwegian resistance was alive and well. They quickly made it to the main basement via a cable tunnel and a window. A Norwegian caretaker by the name of Johansen stopped them, but surely recognizing his countrymen was more than willing to help. The saboteurs then found the heavy water room, placed their explosives on the heavy water electrolysis chambers, and attached long fuses. Johansen stopped them again. He couldn't find his glasses, and he insisted on not leaving without them. Apparently, good glasses are very hard to find during wartime. Thankfully, this Hollywood-style twist didn't give the group away. The glasses were found, and the fuses lit. Without a single shot fired or life lost, the Norwegian team escaped the plant and then the explosives destroyed most of the world's heavy water-producing electrolysis chambers and over 100 gallons of the critical liquid. The entirety produced after the Germans invaded. 3,000 German soldiers were sent out across the Norwegian plateau to look for the commandos and Johansen, but they found no one. The men had successfully completed their mission without knowing a thing about atomic bombs without knowing what heavy water even was. Unfortunately for the Allies, heavy water production at Vermork would resume, and this time, not even Allied bombing raids would stop it. Just a year later in 1944, the Germans were again making D2O, and were planning on moving a large volume of semi-processed heavy water back to Germany. The Allies' answer to this intercepted information was again, sabotage to destroy the liquid shipment by any means necessary. On February 20th, 1944, a ferry was carrying barrels of heavy water across Lake Tin on a railway ferry. It would only make it halfway. An explosion rocked the vessel around midnight, and it quickly sank hundreds of meters to the cold, dark bottom. 
Norwegian soldiers had placed eight and a half kilograms of plastic explosives on the bow when no one was looking, and then set it off. This time, there were casualties. Four Germans and 14 unfortunate Norwegians. But also, the entire supply of Germany's heavy water. Later that year, Vimork would be abandoned, and all operations were moved inside Germany. Today, you can follow in the saboteur's footsteps and take guided tours of their arduous mission. Operation Gunnerside has now been memorialized in movies, books, and TV miniseries, and has been called, quote, the most successful act of sabotage of World War II and one of the most dramatic and important military missions of the war. It did, in fact, live in Norway's memory for a hundred years, as the colonel claimed. Even if the mission didn't fully and completely destroy what the Uranium Club in Nazi Germany thought was their key to victory, it's arguable that those few good men on a dark winter night set back Germany's atomic program just enough to prevent it from changing the course of the war and of history. Today, the historical consensus is that even if the Germans got a maximum rate of Norwegian heavy water delivered to them, they still wouldn't have had enough to start up their own nuclear reactor, let alone produce the plutonium needed for an atomic weapon. Still, Operation Gunnerside is considered one of the most successful sabotages in all of World War II. It bent the arc of history, however slightly, away from an alternate and possibly terrifying future. Until next time.